Let's start with the summary before we get into anything too ma too major. Uh, we've been looking at the 13 uh, messages between chapter 1 and chapter 9. We've looked at um, 11 of those messages. Today we're going to look at 12 and 13. The, uh, the messages here, I'm pretty sure you guys were all here for the first message in chapter 1. Listen to your parents. Second message, say no. Uh, third message, don't reject wisdom. Fourth, don't uh, seek wisdom. Fifth, the characteristics of wisdom. Uh, the sixth, wisdom is a family treasure. Seventh, choose life. Eighth, sin is enticing. You guys all remember this, right? The ninth was be faithful to your spouse. The, spouse. the tenth was avoid sin, laziness, and deceit. And the eleventh uh, was the consequences of sexual, sexual sin. So were there any questions from any of that that we've looked at with Proverbs? No? Okay, cool. So the question of the week was, what verses in chapters 1 through 9 are most important to you and why? I will share mine at the end of the lesson. Well, yeah, sort of at the end. Anybody? I didn't read them. Okay, that's fine. Mine is the um, the enticement of the nuns. So I guess one eight through nineteen. Um, just because like you don't you don't realize how how sin can easily come into your life. And by reading this, you kind of see the progression of it, and then you're able to look out for it. Mm. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Was that? Did you have anything else? Okay. Anybody else? Go. Okay. Well, if there's anything that you guys think of. Flag me down. Okay. So you get a point for that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Nice try. Uh oh. Guys, I don't have it where it where it This is the second time week I've forgotten this, guys. Third? Well who's keeping track? Chuck. I <laughs> The last thing I do before I finish up the slide is I go through and make it where it pops up one by one. And evidently, I didn't do that. Yeah. Buddy, there's another one. There's another one. We have two of those. I don't know. Well, in this case, you can take it. <laughs> Do you need my pill? Here. Diana. Diana. Oh, sorry. So, chapters, uh, chapter 10, verse 1 through uh -huh. 22, verse 16 is all one related thing. Do what now? The Proverbs of Solomon. Yeah. And it goes, goes, yeah. To 22. Chapter 22? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we'll look at that more as we get there, but yeah, pretty much. Um, after the 13 messages, there's one huge chunk of it yeah, that's just... from like yeah. chapter 10 to yeah. 22. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And then there's, um, after that, there's a bit that Hezekiah added. And then it ends with the things of Lemuel and the wife of character and... The other guy. <clears throat> Agar or whatever. I'll take it. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. I have fixed my error. The my way error. of folly. My way of folly. Mm -hmm. And that takes us to the 12th message. We are almost done with the 13 messages, guys. Almost. There's 13 altogether. Yeah. Um, in, in that first in that first nine chapters. The, 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 the father, son, you know... Here are the words, words of my son, and then as Chuck was saying, chapter 10 picks up with just general proverbs of, of Solomon. Now, here's the difference, guys. In the first nine chapters, most of the things are connected, or you know, there's a progressive thought. Once you hit chapter 10, 
that might not be the case. They might there might be a theme. From verse to verse, they're going to be different. Right, but overall, it's like when you're reading an epistle, uh, the letters in the New Testament, you know, First Corinthians. There's a flow of thought, and each chapter kind of connects with each other. But once you hit chapter ten, that's not really a thing anymore. Yeah, and, and there are themes. There are general themes. The wise person, the foolish person. You know, uh, laziness is foolish. Uh, work, being, being hard and working diligently, that's wise. You know, that kind of stuff. Right. And it kind of builds on that foundation of the first nine chapters. But even though it's still a connected book doesn't mean that each verse is going to necessarily be adding on to the last verse. Does that make sense? We'll talk more when we get there next week, but yeah. Um, so pretty much, much the, the 12th message is all of chapter 8, verses 1 through 36. So that makes it really easy. And then the 13th message is all of chapter 9, so <laughs> that makes that really easy. Uh -huh. um, and and the, main message of the, uh, the main message of the 12th one is that wisdom is a benefit. And we will look at that breakdown right now. Does not wisdom call, does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates in the front of the town, at the entrance of the portal, she cries aloud. To you, O men, I call, and my cry is to the children of men. O simple ones, learn prudence. O foolish, learn sense. Hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right. For my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. Uh, they are all straight to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. Take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than jewels, and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. So this is the first first little section, verses 1 through uh, 11. And he has, uh, he has wisdom kind of personified, uh, actually talking to people. Um, and calling to them. So the first thing that we see is from verse 1, and that wisdom is easily gained, and something in us desires it. Look, 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 look what it says. Does not wisdom call? It's an open invitation to everyone. You know, but then also there's, there's another little thing that he's saying, he's saying here too, is that deep inside us, we all desire wisdom. Oftentimes we harden ourselves to it, but somewhere in us there's that, there's that, Longing for wisdom, for understanding, to, to know, to understand things in the world. Nobody wants to wants to be ignorant in the world. But the problem is, oftentimes the cost of wisdom is too much for people to to invest, to buy into. Buy into. Mm -hmm. So, does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? It's something that can be found. Um, and then in verse 6, on the heights that beside the way, at the crossroads she takes her stand. Verse 3, besides the gate in front of the town, at the entrance of the portal she cries aloud. Verse 4, to you, O men, I call and my cries to the children of men. Five, verse 5, O simple ones, learn prudence. O fools, learn sense. Uh, then verse 6, hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right. So we see here that the way of wisdom are the, the ways of wisdom are the ways of good. Look what he said. Look what she says here. Here, for I will speak noble things, upright things, righteous things, and from my lips will come what is right. See, oftentimes what we do is we use the excuse of I know what is right and I have wisdom, so we excuse it. I'm wise enough, so I'm not going to listen to what you have to say. I'm not going to listen to your advice because I'm wise enough. But that's not what it says. It says here, for I will speak noble things. And from my lips will come what is right. A lot of times, also what we do is we justify how it's okay for us to commit this crime that's that's not right for other people because it's us. I can gossip because I'm above a bad attitude. I can complain about the direction of the church or the pastor, about my parents or this or that, whatever well, is you mean complain about. Well, like, I can drink because, you know, I don't get drunk. It doesn't affect me. Alcohol doesn't affect me. It's like, okay, you're an alien, or <laughs> I don't understand how that works. <laughs> well, I, mean, where I know how to control it. Yeah. Yeah. Do Robot bender. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay. But then we see in verses 8, From my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. Which leads us to the next logical conclusion from verse 6, that you can't live your way and be wise. Wisdom is not living your own way, getting your own desires. That's not wisdom. I mean, wisdom is about something bigger than yourself. And he, he, he's been explaining what wisdom is, but then throughout the rest of the uh, book, chapters 10 through 31, 
uh, he's going to talk even further about the ways of wisdom. Um, so all the words of my mouth are righteous. And then we get down to verse uh, 10, going through verse 9. They are all straight to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. Take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold, for wisdom is better than jewels, and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. So what we see here is that nothing will make us happier than wisdom. People always look for different things in life that makes them that will make them happy. You know, a perfect job and all these different things. But the truth is, wisdom makes us happy. Well, now, how, but I thought God makes us happy. Wisdom is the knowledge of God. Wisdom is the fear of God. Wisdom leads to God, which makes us happy. See what I mean? Wisdom isn't the end point. Wisdom is the starting and the end point. It gets us there. See what I mean? So it's not contradictory to say that we find our happiness in God and we find our happiness in wisdom because where wisdom is there is God and where God is there is wisdom. See what I mean? So nothing will make us happier than wisdom. And notice how he compares it to these things that people strive after. Take my instruction instead of silver knowledge rather than choice gold. Now remember, King Solomon is very wealthy. He has these things. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> he has these things. Yeah. And uh, so he's telling them, okay, as someone who has both wisdom and wealth, let me kind of clue you in here. The wisdom is better. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> as soon as it loads, there we go. So then that takes us to verse 12. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence, and I find knowledge and discretion. So let's look at these words here. The first two I want to look at is prudence and discretion. Okay, now if you look at the verse, they're kind of used synonymously, and, and they do they are very similar. Wisdom and knowledge and prudence and discretion. These two things are kind of like um, complementary ideas. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. So there's wisdom and prudence, and I find, and I find knowledge and discretion. So there's, those kinds of two things are going to mirror each other. Knowledge mirrors wisdom, and um, prudence uh, mirrors uh, discretion. Now, the, the people often ask, is there a difference between knowledge and wisdom? And if there is, it's a very slight, very slight difference in the book of Proverbs. In English, there's a difference, but in, and we're talking about in Proverbs. So let's, let's look at this a little bit. Prudence is a careful to avoid error. That's prudence. Careful of your ways. When you give careful thought to something, but discretion is cautious and correct judgment. So if you see, they're real similar, real similar, and that's why they're used interchangeably here. But it's kind of like this bigger idea to to get to give careful thought before you make a decision. See what I mean? That's wisdom, and that's why it says, "I wisdom dwell with prudence," because wisdom is not quick to act. Wisdom is thoughtful. Okay. Um, so the knowledge would be, if there is a discretion, a, a distinction between knowledge and wisdom, this is it. Knowledge is having information, and wisdom is doing the right thing or understanding the right thing. So knowledge is more like the actual knowing something, and wisdom is the actual uh, putting that knowledge into action. If there is, if there can be a distinction between the two. Um, but if you've read the blog that I posted onto the Yams thing, you've already read that, so it's not really that important. Um, so these things go together. You can't pick and choose. What some people do is is they fool themselves into thinking that they're wisdom, that they're wise, and then they start acting real impatiently. They don't start thinking out their ways. They just you know. And the the truth is, wisdom dwells with prudence. You know what I mean? You can't you can't separate the two things there. Um, I wisdom dwell with prudence, and I find knowledge and discretion. Now notice how it says that. I thought this was interesting. I didn't pick it up until the other day. How I find knowledge. In other words, it's on a search for something, and it finds what it's searching for, knowledge. So, I mean, let that be said of you. Are you searching for something that you will find, knowledge? <clears throat> I'm sorry. Let me go back. It's okay. I need some water. Anyways. So, if you look here... Chapter 8 is broken up into these kind of paragraph patterns. You, you've got verses 1 through uh, 11 where the, where the uh, wisdom as a woman is, cry, is calling out. Then you've got verses 12 through, I think it's 20-something, 20 21 maybe? 21. Yeah, where it talks about um, – actually, it's just kind of the, the talk continued. Where am I talking about? There, verse 22 is where, where it happens. Um, 
it, and in 22 it switches it's still talking wisdom like a woman is talking but instead it switches to the cosmic importance of of, of um, wisdom so everybody got those notes written down okay okay so I wanted to point out a few things that that are brought up in this in this section here. It, we look, just looked at verse twelve. If you go to the very next verse, verse thirteen, it says this: "The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil are perverted speech. And, and perverted speech I hate." So remember, in verse it was like eight or something like that, eight or seven or eight of chapter one. It said that the fear that the that the beginning of wisdom is, or the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So this kind of adds on to that. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, which is kind of what I what I was already talking about, but I think it really summarizes it. So let's let's put those two things together. The beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord, which is hatred of evil. See, the fear of the Lord gives us a reason to act right, righteously, right? Because if there is no God, it ultimately doesn't matter whether we right, act wisely or fully. You know, eat and drink for tomorrow we die, basically. But with with wisdom and with the ex existence of God, that that opens something else up. So the beginning of knowledge is that fear of the Lord, which leads to the hatred of evil. Because a wise person can't accept wicked ways and realizing that they're not wise. See what I mean? Is it wise to cheat on your spouse? Is it what what are the things he's been talking about? Is it wise to indebt yourself to a debtor? See what I mean? Are these things wise? So. Um, it takes us to verse 13 here where it says, The fear of the Lord, uh, I'm sorry, the second part of that, Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. So we see here uh, three things. Pride, arrogance, uh, the way of evil, and perverted speech I hate. Okay? So if you look, uh, there's something I was going to say about this and I forgot, so I'm just going to plow ahead and hope that I remember it later. <laughs> I don't want to waste time. Um, obviously these things are, are not wise. Now, notice the things that he chose to pick out. Pride and arrogance. Think about that. Pride and arrogance. That those things are foolish. See, the person who thinks that they're wise thinks that, thinks that they've reached the climax of understanding, right? But the truly wise person says, wow, I don't know so much more than I do know. And I'm lacking. See what I mean? Not in a self-defacing way that you, you know, just hate yourself but in a way that you realize the truth. So the things that he notes here, pride and arrogance, the way of evil, okay, and perverted speech. Those th in fact, let's separate them into four different things for the sake of, uh, of ease. Pride and arrogance, that'll be, that'll be two things there, okay? And then the way of evil, that would be acting in an immoral way. And then the fourth thing, perverted speech. Crazy. That those were the things that he that he, that he emphasized. I can I can see the the way of evil, right. but pride and arrogance, and then perverted speech. I'm like, whoa, whoa, because a lot of people do these things and they just like write it off and they still see themselves as perfectly wise. It's like, whoa, yeah. what? <laughs> Anyways, which all obviously leads to the conclusion that if you're growing in wisdom, you should be shrinking in pride and arrogance. Living your own way, doing evil things, perverted speech, those kinds of things. You should be decreasing in that. Um, so in that way, you could actually test whether you are gaining and gaining wisdom or not. Are these things increasing or decreasing in your life? Do you listen to people now more than you did a year ago or less than you did a year ago? When people say things that you don't like, do you instantly get mad and discredit them or do you actually listen to them? See what I mean? Kind of a little test for yourself. Um, obviously, if you lie to yourself about your problems, then it's not going to be a real test. You know? Uh, verse uh, 14, I have counsel and sound wisdom, I have insight, I have strength. By me kings reign and rulers decree what is just. Now what he's saying there is that people who don't rule wisely usually are ousted from their leadership. <laughs> Whereas leaders, they are tasked with being wise. So that's what, he's ta what she's talking about here. Right. By me kings reign and rulers decree what is just. By me princes rule and nobles all who govern justly. justly. I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently find me. Awesome reminder. We already looked at that a couple weeks ago, so I don't want to waste more time, but just an awesome reminder. Um, because, you know, it didn't say, you know, 
to give qualifications for who could seek and find. It said, all who seek me will find me. So, there's that. Because I, 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 I hate to belabor the point, but I've known a lot of people who said, you know, I just can't understand the Bible. I just, I just can't get it. You know, I've tried, I tried praying. To read it once. Yeah, I tried to read it once. It didn't make sense. I, I tried to pray, and it's just, it didn't really seem like anything's happening. You know, it, all these different things. And what does it say there? I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently will find me. You know what I mean? Right. There is no such thing as a lost cause. If you no. seek after God and God's ways, yeah, He, yeah. right, He, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you. He will work in you. Um, and, okay, awesome. So then. That takes us to verses 18 through 19. Riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. Now, he just said, he just said that wisdom is better than wealth. And now he says, riches and honor are with me, enduring wealth and righteousness. Okay. So there's two things there. First off, wisdom is better than riches, but riches are its fruit. Because wise people handle their affairs wisely. They don't waste all their money. Why is people work diligently and build up their wealth slowly instead of trying to get it all quick through get rich schemes? Yeah. Ponzi schemes, all this different stuff. Right. Um, anyways, but then also, if you note know what he said there, he's talking about more than just earthly wealth, isn't he? Because look yeah. what he says enduring wealth. Well, what's enduring wealth? Well, in a physical sense, it's wealth that you, you, you've you worked for and it's not gone overnight. But you're not living paycheck, paycheck to paycheck because you're living wisely. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's that. But more than that, the next verse even clarifies. Um, 19. My fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield than choice silver. And was that what I wanted to say? No, that wasn't what I wanted to say. Well, I don't remember what I, part I was pointing at anyways, but I guess I'll just... Forget what I was about to say and go back on track. <laughs> uh, the idea of, of wisdom gives you something that this world can't. You know, regardless of wherever that other verse was that I was going to point out <laughs> that I seem to have misplaced. I know it's in here because it's the Bible. You know, I don't think it, it just disappeared. But I know it's there somewhere. I, I can't find it. Anyways, the idea that it's, it's something lasting that's with you throughout your, your life and the next. Okay? So how... We're going to end this this discussion of Proverbs is we're going to look at a book called um, – it's by John Eldridge. Something like Raising the Dead, I think, is something like that. Can you look that up, please? Because <laughs> if at all possible, if you have the time, I would like you guys to look at look at this book and to read it. Um, if you have time, if you don't, that's okay. But we are is going to be the last after we finish up chapter thirty one of Proverbs. Is it called Waking the Dead? Maybe. Do we have the well, book? You do, and then so I stole it from you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Waking the dead. What? Waking, Waking the Dead. The dead? One of his. Yes, that's the one. Waking the Dead by John Eldridge. It's basically the idea of living a fuller life here. Right. Because a lot of times we emphasize the eternal. Well, that's great. So God's just going to ditches in the present. Hmm. And the idea is no, God also came to give us an abundant life here on earth until we get there. Right. So just a little bit of spoiler there, and I don't want to get too much on that, but I think it, it's really going to be a great conclusion of the book of Proverbs. Anyways, um, so then verse 19, uh, my fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield than choice silver. Okay, so any questions on that? I know I kind of went fast through some of that. We're good? Awesome. Remember to stop me if you have a question. So then we keep going uh, all the way through, through uh, 31. <clears throat> I walk in the way of righteousness and the paths of justice, granting an inheritance to those who love me and filling their treasuries. Notice what he says there. Wisdom is such an inheritance. It's, a, such, it's, it's, it's something that – what do people usually have in their inheritance, right? They, they, they give their house. They give their, their belongings. But look what it said there. It's taken the place of those other things as inheritance, granting an inheritance to those who love me. Giving something that they didn't have previously and filling their treasuries. And uh, the Lord possessed me at the. Now this is where we get into the section 22 through 31 that that shows wisdom as as having cosmic importance. Okay. Now 
some people have just copped out of this by saying, oh, it's just pointing forward to Jesus and leaving it at that. I think that when you do that, you miss what he's really saying about wisdom here. So let's look at this and don't just substitute Jesus. Okay, Think of it as wisdom. Okay, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. Ages ago I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs, abounding with water. Before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills I was brought forth, before he had made the earth with, it, with its fields, or the first of the dust of the world. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundation of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the children of man. Um, and then verse uh, 32 through 36 are kind of like a, a closing thing, so we're not going to look at that right now. Let's focus on this on this thing here. The, remember, if you just instantly say it's Jesus, you miss what he's saying about Proverbs. First off, Jesus was never formed. So we know that he's not actually talking about Jesus, is he? He's talking about wisdom. Jesus always existed. There was never a point in or out of time when Jesus was not Jesus. Okay. The only thing that changed when he came onto this earth is what, what the psalmist says, Today I have begotten you. Because he wasn't a human before, but God bore him of the Virgin, Virgin Mary. Does that make sense? He was born of the Virgin Mary. That was something that he had not been before. He had never been a human before. But now he is fully human and fully God, and there will never be a moment in time when he's no long, when he's not fully human. Okay, does that make sense? Because he was God, always been God, always will be God. Okay, but then he became a person, and that he took he didn't change who he was. He just added on to who he was. If that makes sense. Okay, and now he will live forever as that. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So. We're not, we're not talking about Jesus. Get that idea out of your head. Look what he's saying, though. Th there's two things I want to I want to point. Well, one thing, but before I get there, let's just go to this. Everything God does is wise, and wisdom has cosmic importance. That's that's the that's basically what he's saying here. The importance of wisdom. That God Himself had wisdom. So how much more? It's kind of like the 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 comparison. This is something that God does in all of His acts. So how much more do you need it? See what I mean? But um. But then there's the idea that everything that God does is wise. Now, something that I thought was interesting is where he says right here in verse 23. No, verse 24. Right, yeah, verse 24. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water. This doesn't necessarily mean that wisdom was created. Okay, It just means that wisdom was brought to the forefront as an option of living because remember before there was something created there was no opportunity for foolishness but once something was created there was now an opportunity for foolishness or wisdom does that make sense mm -hmm. so it was brought to the for forefront okay however there is also the idea that uh, of of creation obviously if god everything god does is wise then his ways itself are wise so there couldn't have been a moment in time when god was not wise so we know that he's not talking about the ultimate beginning of wisdom Okay, right? You guys are giving me strange looks. Does it kind of make sense? Okay. So with that being said, we can safely assume that that if he is talking about the so-and-so creation of wisdom, he's more talking about the way that, um, as an analogy, um, how do I want to say this? Okay, it's like this. Wisdom isn't really a woman calling out in the streets, right? It's an analogy to help you grasp the idea that it's there for those who are finding it. So in the same way, verses 22 through 31 could be an analogy of basically God saying this thing's really important. It ever since there was creation, there was wisdom, and it's something you should seek after. See what I mean? Just kind of a, an analogy to help you grasp its importance in the cosmic level. That kind of makes sense. Um, anyways. And there are other uh, under possible understandings, but I don't think that it's worth our time to look at them right now. Uh, so then verses 32 through 36. And now, o sons, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Oh, obviously there, there's, there's, a third, there's a third option besides the things that I said. 
And that's that, I'm, that I just read too much into it, and it was just meant to be more poetical than anything. That's a possibility, too. So, verses 32 through 36. And now, O sons, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways, hear instructions, and be wise, and do not neglect it. Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors, for whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who fails to find me injures himself. All who hate me love death. That's going to be a resounding theme. He's going to say that almost the exact same thing in chapter 9, verse 12. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone will bear it. And we'll look at that in just a second. Excuse me. But the idea here is that wisdom has a way of changing your view of life and just changing how you act too. Let, let's look at this verse by verse. And now, sons, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. There's two things to remember about, about when the Bible says blessed. One is the natural result of following wisdom's ways is blessings. And the second way of looking at it is that God blesses those who seek after wisdom. Does that make sense? One is God is directly causing the action of blessing. The other one is that blessing is the natural result of wisdom. Does that make sense? And I think that it has a little bit of both understandings in it. Verse 33, hear instructions and be wise and do not neglect it. Very important uh, verse. Hear instruction and be wise. Hear instruction. What do you hear people talking about all the time? You keep your convictions to yourself, and I'll keep mine to, mine to me. I can live my life however I want. Let me live my let me do my own thing. Whenever somebody tells them what to do, you butt out. See what I mean? Uh, I'm my own. I'm my own adult. I'm my own person. I'm my own, I'm my own boss. You know all these different things. Arrow. I follow my own arrow. All these different kind of ideas. And somebody says something, and we instantly get pissed off at them, right? Like here's one. I want to get a tattoo. Um, I actually designed it and everything. However, I do not get tattoos because I don't see it as wise in my position at this time. Okay. Is that going to make sense? But now let's assume that I had gotten a tattoo and a well-meaning Christian, because usually the Christians that we see as enemies really are well-meaning, comes to me and says, you know, this is evil. Shouldn't have gotten that tattoo. You know, tries to make me feel bad, like I need to repent for it, which of course is wrong, but let's just assume that. And instead, I get mad at them, right? Well, I decided that well, I don't think it's wrong to get a tattoo. That's not the ways of wisdom. See what it said there? Hear instruction and be wise. But I don't like what they said. I don't agree with what they said. Here's another example. Someone's just loud, obnoxious person. They always got to get their fingers in everything, right? So then you do something, and they instantly hop down your throat for it. That's not how you should do that. I've got people at church all the time who nag me about the way I raise my children. See what I mean? I totally understand this one. And what do you, what do you want to do? But out of my life. Let me do my own thing my way, and if my children die, call CPS. Otherwise, I think I'm taking care of them. You know what I mean? You get this idea of, you know what, just butt out. I'm doing it my way. It's okay, right? Yeah. Hear instructions and be wise. But they didn't say it right. But I don't even like them. Hear instruction and be wise. See, when we start putting filters on who we do and do not take wisdom from, we do not end up wise. We end up as fools. Well... Go ahead. And a lot of times, once they've done something that we didn't agree with or we didn't like or whatever, if they come back to us with something else, we just shut them out before they even get started. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, I think you guys get that verse. Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. The idea of earnestly desiring more wisdom, right? For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. Somebody said, and I'm paraphrasing here, that the first drink of science makes you an atheist. But once you reach the bottom of the cup, it makes you understand God all the better. And I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. He was a chemist or something like that, so he said it in this real big words and stuff. I'm excluding all that. <laughs> Simplified version. Okay, This is the NIV version of what he said. <laughs> and... Uh, that's kind of that, that's kind of how how life works. In a in a more broad way, though. What, I'm trying to think of a better way to say this. I 
I can't think of a better way to say it. There's just... There's just no other, there's no better way to say it. With wisdom, you, when you first start learning the ways of wisdom and knowledge, you, you reach this place of plateau. You know, it, it happens usually between one to four years where you think you are the smartest person in the world. It's like you reach this pinnacle. You understand everything. Everybody else is an idiot. Nobody could ever understand how things like you do. See what I mean? And then if you can just power through that, time of, of arrogance you break through and you realize that there's so much more out there so I would say the same thing about science but about wisdom the first little taste of wisdom makes you doubt God God's not real that doesn't make any sense but the more you press into wisdom the more you find out that God is found in wisdom if you have come to the conclusion that there is no God through science or wisdom it's because you stopped before you were done. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? You were already in your mind. Yeah. And what people do, especially people who grew up in the church where, where the church didn't answer their questions, they start hearing things from science, right? About the Big Bang Theory and all these different things. And they think, oh, this instantly disproves God. And so you just don't even try. Rather than, okay, what what is the evidence? Now, what does the Bible actually say? Now, let's study this and seek after God. Right. See what I mean? They, oh, no, science disproves it. No, science doesn't disprove God. I had a very, very meaningful conversation with somebody on Facebook. I, I know that sounds like a contradiction. Meaningful conversation on Facebook, but I, I, I swear, a meaningful conversation with somebody on Facebook. Huh. And basically, the idea of it was this. He has been mistreated by religious people. And so it's burned him off of God. And people who do that... They they don't say that right off. They'll say something like, "Doesn't make sense. God, there's no there's no evidence of God's existence." You know, and, and they'll say roundabout things like that. So then, after a while of arguing with them for whatever point that is, because you're not trying to just win arguments, then eventually they come to the place of religious people, and then ah, okay, now I see what's going on here. You're burned out of religious people. It has nothing to do with science. See what I mean? And that's kind of my point, is the first little taste of wisdom, the first little taste of science can oftentimes turn people off of God, and they stop there. Keep seeking after God, and you will find them. You will. But the problem is you can't stop. You have to actually tune in there. So then verses 35 through 36, whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. Verse 36, but he who fails to find me injures himself. All who hate me love death. Have you ever heard someone who – somebody said something wrong to them and said, I'm not going to listen to them, idiot. And they think they're really showing it to them. They're not going to listen to them. He who fails to find me injures himself. When you don't listen to those people and you're trying to show them something, you're injuring yourself. It's you love death. You are desiring death on yourself. Who are you really getting back at by sticking it to them? Yourself! You're screwing yourself over! He who fails to find me injures himself. But I don't agree with what they said. I don't like how they said it. I don't even like them. He who fails to find me injures himself. I, I don't understand why we're missing this one. Because I tell you what, I just discovered that this was in there this week, guys. I've read Proverbs before. I never knew this verse was in there. Tell you what, when I, when I understood what he was saying... Because oftentimes when we, when, when we read Proverbs, we don't actually see how it applies to our real life, right? right. Oh, well, that's interesting. That, that yeah, sounds good. But then like when it comes to, okay, but what about this? I don't get the connect. You see what I mean? Yeah. So, awesome. That finishes up the 12th message. Any questions on that message? No? The main theme of it was? Yeah. Wisdom is a benefit. And now the last of the 13 messages. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Comparison of wisdom and foolishness. Now this, I love this chapter. It starts out with wisdom. Then it has this neat little thing in between 
and then it goes to foolishness. This is the first time so far in the book that foolishness has been personified as a woman. So now we have two women. One is foolish and one is wise. Very interesting. I love this chapter. This is probably my favorite of the, of the nine chapters, okay? So it's it's the whole chapter, but as you can see, it's a lot shorter than chapter eight was. It only has 18 verses. Yeah. Um, and so let's start. Uh, well, first, let me recap something that we said in eight, that wisdom was portrayed as cosmically powerful, right? It was there with God at the creation. I mean, cosmic importance, it's this powerful force, right? And it's available to all. Those are both things we've, we've found out so far. Mm -hmm. So now, now, let, now let's read through 9. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beasts. She has mixed her wine. She has also set uh, her table. So the first thing we see is the seven pillars. Pillars. Now, seven is, oft, is oftentimes uh, in the Bible the idea of perfection and completion. Okay. For instance, if you look in Genesis, the table of nations, right? It talks about in uh, chapter, I want to say 12 or 11, probably 11. Yeah, because 12 is where Abraham is really uh, the forerunner. They're in chapter, oh, actually it starts in 10. These are the generations of the son of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, and then in, uh, is it there that I'm thinking of? No, I'm sorry. It's verse ten. Uh, the sons of these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem. No, I said that right. Yeah, I said that right. Uh, and he goes through how many nations? Seventy nations come from the three sons. See, the idea of seventy is often seven times seven times seven seventy. The idea of completion. And I believe um, in one of the one of the gospels it says how many times do I have to forgive him seven times. Seven, and then another one says seven times ten, or I forget. Seventy times seven. Seventy times seven, yeah. So once again, there's the idea of completion. Exactly. See what I mean? Exactly. So the idea that Jesus is saying he's not giving an actual number, then he's actually just saying, let your love be perfected. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyways, so the seven pillars are not actually seven things. I, I, I want to emphasize this because a lot of people will, will try and name the seven things. Yeah. <laughs> there are not actually seven things. The idea here is that this house that the woman has built is perfect. It's complete. Perfection is in the woman's house. Wisdom has has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. Her house is perfect in every way. Wisdom is perfect. You need wisdom. That's the that's the whole point. Okay, don't get carried away with these people who have to name the seven things. That's uh, like people who who try to name the three nails that were in Jesus when he was hung on the cross. <laughs> okay, guys, wind it back in. <laughs> like you know, this now. Okay. So verse 3, she has sent uh, out her young women to call from the highest places in the town. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. Now, remember very carefully what she says here because woman folly says something very contradictory to what she just said. Okay. So the first thing is the idea of, I mean, the, the last thing I really want to emphasize in these first five verses here is the idea that to dwell with wisdom, be immersed in her. Okay, look at what it says here. Whoever's simple, let him turn in here, right? Uh, sorry, that's my phone. Okay, and then right here, come eat my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the ways of insight. Leave everything that you, everything that you are and come in my ways, right? Eat of my bread, drink of my wine, the idea of being immersed with wisdom, okay? Dwell with her. And so that takes us through verses 6 through 10 here. I want to go ahead and pop that up there. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse. So ver verses 1 through 6, we're talking about the wise woman, wisdom, uh, lady wisdom. 13 through 18 are wisdom fo uh, lady folly. And 7 through 12, contrast the two, okay? So 7, whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse. A scoffer, you guys know what a scoffer is, right? Did I write that one down? No, I didn't. A scoffer is like, you know, like when somebody tries to give them instruction, they make fun of the person. Idiot. All right. How stupid is that that they think it's a sin to get to? A tattoo. How stupid is that that they think it's wrong to drink? How stupid is that? That's a scoffer. Someone who's the 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 someone who rolls their eyes. You know, uh, who sighs whenever somebody tells them to do something. That's a scoffer. Okay. Um, whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse. It comes back on them. 
Um, and he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man he will love you. See, he just clarified what he was saying. What, what does that mean? Uh, corrects a scoffer gets himself abused. How? Because a scoffer will hate you. He may even strike you. Some people, when, when, you, when you tell them what they're doing is stupid, <laughs> for instance, obviously not in those ways be more diplomatic. But when you say something, <laughs> you know, they, they turn to physical violence. You know, that, that's true, too. Um, sometimes people will go out of the way to, to spitefully do things just to get you back. Surely you guys have never heard of someone doing that, right? Um, but then he contrasts here. In the middle of eight, there's a break. Re it says, do not reprove a scoffer, he'll hate you. But then there's a break. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, he will be still wiser. In other words, wise men realize that they don't have all knowledge. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So now we have to, we, we can add on to our statement a little bit more. The beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord, which is the hatred of evil, which is brought by the knowledge of God. <laughs> Just in case you're not getting it, he keeps clarifying, coming back to this and adding more to it and changing it as he's going on. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. For by me your days will be multiplied, and your uh, your years will be added, and years will be added to your life. We already looked at that a couple weeks ago. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone will bear it. I already talked about this in verse eight, but here it is again in the middle of verse of chapter nine. Sorry, I already mentioned it in chapter eight. Here it is again in chapter nine. Um, and this is is the verse out of all the chap all the nine chapters that was most important to me, because that. I feel like it just so much relates to me as a person. Like, I never – adultery just seemed obvious. Like, hey, don't do that. you know. And working hard seemed obvious too. I mean, you don't work. You don't have money. You don't have money. I mean, it's not, the, it's not rocket science. But this one, this one literally blew my mind, guys. <laughs> like, this is something that I never even heard, heard somebody say something like this. This is what I have heard people say. You live your life for you, honey. You just do whatever feels good to you. You do whatever you want. That's not what he's saying. Listen, well, this is what he's saying. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. You are benefited by your decision to be wise. If you scoff, you alone will bear it. If you decide to turn your back on wisdom, you will reap the, reap the poison that you have sown into yourself. That's what he's saying. He's saying wise people continue to be wise. <laughs> Don't stop and say, I've had enough of wisdom. This is where I've reached my limit because I'm 50. Because I, I know everything more than everybody around me. Because I, I'm married. Because whatever it is, no, don't stop there. <laughs> See what I mean? If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. And if you scoff, you alone will bear it. I just love that verse. Um. <clears throat> hey, friend. So then... Uh, it's mentioned the scoffer in verse 7. Basically, I already, talked, I already mentioned this. It's uh, it, To scoff is to jeer. It's to speak with contempt. Um, but then we see the, the contrast between the scoffer and the, wis and the wise person, the wise person being the one who listens and learns. Because look what it says here. Whoever corrects the scoffer gets himself abused. So not only did the person not, um, not listen, they went the other direction with it. Whereas the wise person actually stops and listens to what you're saying. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Now, see, what we want to do when we read through Proverbs is we want to think about how this applies to other people. Think how this applies to you. Are you somebody who listens to wisdom? Or are you some, Are you the scoffer who turns, to, turns their back on what somebody's saying? Because if you are wise, you are wise for yourself. And if you're a scoffer, you alone will bear it. See? Oh, I love that verse. Um, we see that it's going to talk about this throughout the rest of the book. Once again, chapter 1 through 9 lay the foundation for the rest of the book, but it doesn't have a, a direct, you know what I mean? You, you can read chapter 10, verse 3, and understand it by itself. It might give you more insight than if you read the first nine chapters. However, so I mean, it, it, it's a standalone verse. Either way, it's a proverb. That's the idea of a proverb is a saying that's proven true through time. It's not a command, and it's not a promise. It's a principle that is proven through two over time. So, um, the scoffer is someone who's short-tempered, someone who's vengeful, someone who's overprotective, somebody who's spiteful, ignorant, and and ignores. Uh, we looked at those throughout the different things here, and we'll look at it again later, but whoever corrects the scoffer gets himself abused, and he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. 
Do not reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. So we see just a few things. And I want to go over that list again. Short-tempered. Easily angered, carries it out on people right away, doesn't give any thought to it. The wise person stops and thinks about something, and the scoffer just plunges ahead. Um, eventual, and also remember I said that the, the, the two, there's really two people throughout the whole book that are contrasted. Wisdom, wise person, a foolish person. Well, a scoffer, being short-tempered, is also the same person who's committing adultery earlier in chapter 7 or whatever, remember? Mm -hmm. Because they don't think about what they're doing. They haven't stopped and thought, hey, is this a good idea for me to do this? Um, vengeful, we see that in the way that he, he tries to get back at the person who was just trying to help him out. Um, overprotective, I don't really think that needs any more explanation than that. Spiteful, ignorant, and ignores this all just kind of, the rest of it is just kind of simple. Any questions on that? I mean, that, that part right there, the last was kind of like, I just threw it in just in case there was anybody who was having problems with the definitions here. Uh, verses 11 through 12. Uh, for by me your days will be multiplied and years will be added to your life. Now, some people who are wise die young. Okay, The point here is that you won't make so many stupid mistakes. That's the idea of it. Okay, So wisdom causes people to live a good life. It's a good life. See what I mean? You know, Jacob, uh, who fathered the 12 tribes of Israel, he lived over 100 years. And you know what he said when he talked to Pharaoh, not even about 19 years before he died. Short, uh, my life's been short and miserable. Yeah. Well, why did he say that? Well, let's go through the list. He had a conflict with Esau th that dominated most of his child life, and then he didn't get to see his parents for years later because he was in Laban's territory where he fought with Laban for years and then when he was done fighting with Laban he came back down to the promised land and his daughter got raped and then all of his sons conspired against him all of them conspired against him and pretended to kill and that Josh and that jo uh, Joseph was dead mm -hmm. so then he spent the next 20 years completely distraught given up on life in depression for the, for the rest of the 20 years until finally Judah comes back to him and says Joseph is alive and he's in, and he's ruling Egypt and it says that the that the breath returned to him so now we have jo Jacob finally enjoying his life living under the wisdom of Joseph in Egypt what made the difference he was living foolishly before then he was an old man and he already felt like his life was wasted he was living under the house of wisdom See the difference there? Because Joseph was wise, and he was handling himself wise. And because of that, he was thinking in the land of Egypt. See what I mean? And so as a result, then Jacob lived 19 years in peace. And those are the best, probably, if I'm reading Genesis correctly, those are the best 19 years of Jacob's life. <laughs> See what I mean? That's the difference between lazy, lady wisdom and lady folly. That wisdom causes people to live a good life. In fact, look at Joseph. Let's continue on this since I brought it up. Anyways, look at Joseph. His 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 eleven, his ten brothers who who betrayed him, because Benjamin had no part of it. Remember, yeah. Benjamin was a toddler at the time. Right. Uh, Joseph's it's ten started it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Joseph's ten brothers um, come to him and 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 they're just distraught. And he says, "You meant this for harm. God didn't." And then. Jacob dies, and they think, oh no, now Joseph's going to get his back because his father's dead. He was just being nice to us because the dad was still alive. And so they go and they send messengers and they, we'll be your servants. And Joseph says, guys, you're not getting this. You intended this thing for evil. God intended it for good. See, why? Because Joseph dwelt with wisdom. He was able to conduct himself in the situation because he had been with wisdom before the situation came. See how that works? Does that make sense? Yeah. If you want to make the right decision, then dwell with wisdom now. Mm -hmm. See, wisdom is a process, okay? So, that ends verse 12. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone will bear it. Now, here we get into where he talks with Lady, um, lady uh, Folly. And the thing about Lady Folly, it's such a contrast with wisdom, guys. Folly is opposite of wisdom and easy to find. Look how verse 13 starts, okay? The woman Folly is loud. Have you ever known one of those women who just, you can hear them talk from across the room? You can walk into Walmart and you hear them from the back of the store. It's like, good God, do you ever shut up? That is Lady Folly, okay? <laughs> the woman of Folly is loud. She is seductive and knows nothing. She gets your attention. 
But she doesn't know anything. <laughs> okay. And then uh, that takes us down through verse 15. What? You want me to go back? Okay. Yeah, chapter 9 was my favorite of the... Uh, chapters 1 through 9, 9 was my favorite. You can you can tell I'm getting all excited about it. <laughs> you guys good? Okay. Um, so then it takes us through uh, 15. She sits at the door of her house. She takes a seat on on the highest places of the town, calling to those who pass by. And the idea here is that she's easy to find. Remember how earlier, a couple chapters ago, wisdom wisdom was, could have been drowned out by drowned? Drowned. Drowned. Drowned, yeah. That's, it doesn't sound right, but it is right. Yeah, yeah. Wisdom could be drowned out by the other noises around. Folly, not not so much. She's loud and obnoxious. She's there. Everybody knows where she's at. Right. She sits at the door of her house. She takes a seat on the highest places of the town. Hey, here I am. Over here, guys. Uh, and then verse 15, calling to those who pass by who are going straight on their way. Uh, we all must choose at this moment what to do. This moment right now, will you be wise or foolish? Because look what it says here. Calling to those who pass by, this is a general, general people, right? But then it says, who are going straight on their way. Yeah. These aren't just idiots. These are people who were going right, which is why I emphasized earlier in chapter 8 and, and actually chapter 9 as well, that wisdom is something that you have to choose to stick with because she's calling to people who are going straight on their way and got them to turn aside to her. Mm-hmm. You can work your whole life being wisdom, uh, being wise, but then give it up in in, in foolishness. So, I mean, I, I have seen people do this. The, Solomon did this. Great example. Solomon, the writer of Proverbs, did this. He was a wise person, then he got distracted with all the other things, and he turned aside to folly, didn't he? Mm -hmm. So, um, okay. I think that's all I wanted to say about verse 15. So that takes us to verse 16. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks sense, she says, if you turn to folly, you become foolish because we all have folly in us. Remember I said that as you go through Proverbs, you'll find something in there that you struggle with. Something somewhere. Because we all have a little bit of folly in us and we all have a little bit of wisdom in us. Mm -hmm. The thing is, which thing are you feeding? So now, excuse me, at verse 16, we reach the conclusion. If you turn to folly, you will become foolish, even if you have worked so many years to become wise, because there's foolishness in all of us. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. And to him who lacks sense, she says. Well, have you ever had a moment of lacking sense? Maybe you did something of that. Ooh, that was stupid. Yeah. 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 That's the foolishness we're talking about, guys. Uh, okay, so that takes us to 17. Stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Now, here we have a contrast with Lady Wisdom, don't we? Yeah. She said, eat my bread and drink my wine. Now, wine is the, with, uh, wine is the idea of celebration, of joy, right? Mm -hmm. But not so much with... Folly. You just have water. Plain, ordinary, dull water. And not only that, but it's stolen water. So it's not even something that she has to give. Water rather than wine. Contrast of wisdom sweetness with folly's blandness. Well, and you also have, it says that she um, slaughtered her beasts. In that, yeah, and then just yeah. You, bread. I was about. Bread I now. actually have it written here on the sides. Yeah. The idea that uh, Lady Wisdom had this banquet, right. and Folly just has a, a scrap of bread and, and, water. and water. I mean, jeez, <laughs> guys. Dry bread too. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Jews either. Twice. Right? Yeah. And with this is the idea, it, it kind of points back to the whole adultery thing that he mentioned two chapters ago? Yeah. Two or three chapters ago. Yeah. Bread eaten in secret, the yeah. idea of adultery, the idea of cheating on somebody, yeah. something done in secret. Nobody will find out. We can get away with it. Remember how he said that? Yeah. She, she doesn't even try to say it's not wrong. She just said, he'll never know. Right. Remember that? Yeah. We talked about that last week, so it had to be in chapter six seven. or seven. It's seven? seven. Yeah, so here it kind of reflects back to that, and so you can see it's talking about more than just yeah. a moment of foolishness, too. It's also talking, reflecting back on the other things of foolishness that it said, which actually he's going to talk about again. I think it's in chapter 12. He says, um, a little a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and uh, f um, disaster, not, not disaster, um, and need will come on you suddenly. Yeah. We'll get to that verse in just a little bit, so I don't want to look at it, but... 
man, oh, guys, and there's the idea of something done. It's just just a moment, you know. It's just a little bit. Oh, just lacking out. Just lacking, just a little bit, you know. It's and it's the same thing with adultery. It's just this one time. It's not that big of a deal, you know. It's just, oh, oh. and it's all all the ways of foolishness are like that. Not well thought out. Yeah. So what people think is they think, well, I've thought about it for a while. That means it's well thought out. No. No, no, no. You can think about something for a long time. That doesn't mean that it's not that it's thought out. Right. I really thought of a whole group plan how to cheat on my spouse. Right, right. It <laughs> wasn't a way. Know. You didn't think uh, it out, though. I mean, uh, here's another example, you know. Um, uh, I'm going to blow all my savings on, on, on buying myself this thing that I don't have time, have money for, like, for instance, a guitar. And I saw, I actually, you, you laugh. You laugh. But somebody did, I, I knew somebody who did this. You know, they, so they spent all their savings account on this on this guitar, and they didn't even play it. They didn't even know how to play the guitar. <laughs> like, see, I mean, it wasn't like Zach's purchase for this truck where now he has a truck. He can get around now. It wasn't like that. I mean, it was a foolish – she didn't even know how to play the guitar, and she wasted all of her savings on this guitar. <laughs> anyways, anyways, I'm getting off, off topic. But you see what I mean? It's just, it's just a little bit. And just because you've thought about it a long time doesn't mean it was well thought out. I know people who are up all night worrying about stuff. Does that mean that they thought it out well, or does that mean they just thought about it a long time? <laughs> See the difference? And there is a difference. Because you ask people this. Now, uh, before you take out that loan, did you, did you think about – oh, yeah, yeah, I've thought about it. This is the best thing to do. Yeah. You mean you thought a long time about it. Let's just back up for a second. <laughs> Let's just think about this first thing. I did this when I went to college. Um, I had made up my decision before we ever got to Best Buy that I wanted to buy a MacBook. And so then we get there, and the salesman just reaffirmed what I already had in my oh, mind. You want to buy a MacBook? Yeah, I was like, I do want it. And so <laughs> my dad was like, okay, let's let's just think about this. We'll, we'll go home, and, and I was like, yeah, well, school so starts what? next week. I was kind of wanting to get my computer set up. You know, I had good reasons for it, but not, you know what I mean? Yeah. Not for necessarily buying a thousand dollar or twelve hundred dollar computer. That's just a laptop. I mean, goodness wow. sakes. No, I could have bought a, a desktop that was better than that. You know. But uh, anyways, so instead of listening to my father, I rushed to the decision of buying a twelve hundred dollar laptop, and uh, well, that was that. <laughs> yeah. See what I mean? I thought about it for a long time. I didn't think it through though. There's a difference. So, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Okay. So then we see, uh, well, I'll go ahead and read verse 18 since we're already there. No, actually, I want to come back to that. Okay, so we'll just go to 15 for a second. Calling to those who pass by who are going straight on their way. Notice how evil is glorified by folly. Mm -hmm. Notice that. Wisdom was all about righteousness and justice, looking out for looking out for, for what's right, that kind of stuff. Folly doesn't care. Folly glorifies in the fact of evil. Uh, and so just a few notes I want to say. First off, um, Wisdom throughout the book is shown as happiness and growth. It's shown as maturity, whereas folly is shown as death and decay. Notice that throughout the book. It always shows folly in the place of death, in the place of going down to Sheol. Um, and another thing I want to point out is that stolen bread hints to sexual immorality. I already mentioned that, but really think about that, guys. Stolen bread. Think about this. We're talking about it. It's implying adultery as well as other things. Bread isn't that great by itself, is it? Much less if it was... Fresh and homemade. Yeah, and yeah. even then, it's usually better with butter on it, right? Or, or jam or something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can eat it by itself. It's like, yeah. yeah. So, but also, did you notice how it kind of also leaves your mouth a little bit dry too? Yeah. It, it it's the same with, with foolishness. It's just a loaf of bread. Whereas wisdom, you had this whole meal here, man. Yeah. yeah there was bread too, but there was a heck of a lot of other yeah, things that sounded pretty a, good. A <laughs> yeah, I mean that, that sounded pretty good to me there. Yeah. But anyways. Um, and then the third thing is that folly hints strongly at the fertility cults we were talking about a week or two ago. Um, basically, there were a lot of fertility cults around Israel and also in, in Canaan, so technically in Israel, um, which obviously went very much so against what the Book of the Law taught Israel, but, you know, still I digress. Um, and there's the idea that, you know, they would do these sacrifices and basically they would have sex. I mean, hey, it's a win-win. You go through your religious thing and then you get to have sex. You know, hey, this sounds like a harmless thing. We talked about that last time with yeah. the guy who's just oblivious. Oh, yeah. It's okay. It's just sex. You know, and oh, boy, did he not understand what he was doing. Uh, uh, but So there's the idea that it's kind of hinting towards that, too. If you look at her. 
Stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. It, it, look where she's calling out and everything. The, the, it, he might be talking about the fertility cult. If he is talking about the fertility cult, I find it funny that he married so many women and had so many concubines. He, you guys understand that he had more women than there were days of the year? Wow. He could literally have sex with a different woman every day of the year and still not make it through all of his women. <laughs> Think about that for a second, okay? We're talking about a multi-year investment. It would take him over three years to have sex with all of his women. Are you guys hearing me? That's having sex every single day with a different woman every single day. And it would take him over three years. So I think that that's funny that if this is hinting towards the fertility cult, <laughs> that it's Solomon who makes the reference. <laughs> oh my gosh. Anyways, um, and there's so there's the idea that you know it looks real pleasant, but it actually only leads to death. So, just like the fertility cult looked good, hey, you know, free sex, you know, everything's looking good, but it only led to death. You're not going to find happiness in that. So anyways, and then um, the fourth thing I wanted to say, uh, people have traditionally said that Proverbs was written towards the beginning of Solomon's life and Ecclesiastes towards the end. But I would like to submit to you a different view. I believe that Proverbs was written throughout the course of Solomon's life. And I personally believe that at the end of Solomon's life, wisdom got the upper hand and he came back to God. That's my own personal view. Because some of these things that he talks about in Proverbs, you can only know if you've done it. I mean, some of these things, it just reeks of experience. You know what I mean? And then some other things that he says, it really sounds like he's grown and matured like he's not a kid anymore you know what i mean now with that being said this can all easily be uh rectified by simply saying that the wisdom was from god he didn't have to have experience because it was directly from god so god gave him the wisdom and i would admit yes that that is another view too um, i just choose to have the optimistic view not really because there's any proof it's just something that that appears to me i could be wrong been wrong before just my idea my theory I wanted to throw that at guys at you guys because as you read through Proverbs, I want you to know, I want you to look out for that. It kind of seems like some of it is, is is said from an older man. You know what I mean? Right. And just because Solomon did have a downhill defeat, let's just say, doesn't mean that he never came back. Because the Bible does leave it open ended that he could have potentially. Right. It says his wisdom, it, says, it, it condemns the things that he does, but it never says necessarily. There are multiple ways of translating. Let's just say it like that. There are multiple ways of understanding. Right. So anyways, going back to chapter uh, 9, uh, the end of the chapter here, the very last verse of the chapter. But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are on the depths of Sheol. Which, if he is talking about the fertility cult, would obviously be talking about death. So we see that folly is compared to the adulterer. If you turn back to 7.22, it says, All at once he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter. And then in verse 27, Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. So not only is he contrasting Lady Folly with Lady Wisdom, he's also contrasting Lady Folly, or comparing, or equating, equating, there's the word I want to use, Lady Folly with the adulteress. So... Uh, that's the end of the 13th message. We, we've gotten through all of it. That, that brings us through chapters 1 all the way through chapter 9. Chapters 10 and up, we're going to we're gonna have to um, go a little bit differently. What we're going to do, because there's really no unifying theme, I'm going to try and make tables and charts where I can, where you can just see the contrast and comparison of folly and wisdom. Or we might go through verse by verse and stop on the key verses that are important or need extra clarification. I don't know. I haven't yet decided. Maybe I'll do a little bit of combination of both. A lot of people um, nowadays in the church haven't ever read the Bible through, so I'm kind of leaning towards reading it through verse by verse. But I hate to bore you guys, so that's why I don't want to go by verse by verse. Do that yeah. Just I'm going to have to spend some time thinking about it. Not with it on my mind, thinking about it. <laughs> so anyways, um, the question of the week, what does the world say life is about? Or what have you heard? What, what, do you, what, what do you think the atmosphere of the world is about 
on life. Um, as maybe it's portrayed in commercials, maybe it's portrayed in movies or music, or maybe the general attitude of the culture, or maybe you see it in politics. Wherever you see it, what do you believe that that the world says life is about? If you get this, you'll be happier, or this is how you should live, or you know whatever. And I want you guys to really dig deep on this. Th think about it as much as you can. You know. Uh, any questions on tonight's lesson? You look like no you're going to say something. No questions, but a comment. Go ahead. Um, I was thinking back to last week when we were talking about adultery almost. Uh -huh. That if they will cheat with you, they'll cheat on you. Thank you for remembering to say that. <laughs> she said that to me after the lesson. I was like, no, I wanted that recorded. Did you guys hear what she said? Yeah. If they will cheat with you, they will cheat on you. Sometimes people think that, oh, no, 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 they love me. Uh, they said that to their spouse, too. <laughs> uh, but that's different. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, they love me. Because they'll break the bond, but they won't break the not bond? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions or comments?